Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Sharon Browse. I'm one of our rabbis here at Icar, and I'm so happy to welcome all of you to this space. And I welcome those who are here in person. It's weird and wonderful to be back together in person. And I also am so grateful to all the folks who are joining us uh, virtually tonight. And I know we have people from all around the country um, who are together with us tonight. So it's really special to be together. A quick word about this space. Um, just before COVID, Icar was able to purchase um, this little piece of land um, to the north and to the south of this area. Um, and in the course of the next couple of years, we're gonna be developing this into um, a the ECAR Center, which will be a platform for spiritual um, and political and intellectual and creative engagement, um, and hopefully a contribution that we can offer to the city of Los Angeles as a physical place for us to gather together, um, to talk about the things that matter most, to lift our voices in prayer, to create art, and to hold really critical conversations, um, which is what we're here to do tonight. So I'm really thrilled on behalf of Icar to welcome everybody here tonight. Um, we're very happy to partner with the New Israel Fund um, and Breaking the Silence. And, uh, and you're gonna hear an incredible conversation tonight um, about, the, about the work of Breaking the Silence. But I wanna just say um, that, that Breaking the Silence started back in the early 2000s, in 2004. And this was an organization that was founded by Israelis who had all, all of whom had served um, in, in the IDF. And they wanted to create a space in which they could talk honestly and openly about what they had experienced when they were serving their country. Um, because many of them were driven by a really fierce sense that the occupation and the mistreatment of Palestinian uh, of the Palestinian people was not only harming Palestinians, but was really gonna destroy the state of Israel if they weren't able to find a way to end the occupation and end it now. Um, sadly, that was about 18 years ago, um, and things in many ways have gotten worse over the course of the years. I can tell you that my experience with Breaking the Silence was absolutely transformative. Um, I was one of those American Jews who fell in love with Israel as I was on my falling in love with Judaism journey. And I remember in the 90s when my sister Devora told me that there were streets in the city of Hebron that were under Jewish control and that Palestinian people were not allowed to walk down these streets. And I told her that she was lying and that that was anti-Israel propaganda and that Israel was a democracy and would never treat human beings like that. And it took many years for me to actually go to Hebron myself. Um, I was guided by Avner Gvaryahu, who's one of the co-founders of Breaking the Silence, and to actually see on the ground things that I didn't want to see, and to hear stories that I didn't want to hear. And some of what you hear tonight might also be something that you don't want to see and don't want to hear. I know some of you pretty well, so I know that you already are, are, are familiar with the work and maybe you're, you yourselves have gone and seen. And for others, I imagine this is gonna be the first time that you're hearing some of these stories. And I know that for many of us, especially in a time of heightened anti-Semitism in our own country, in our own city and around the world, it feels particularly treacherous to be talking about bad behavior um, from uh, from Israel. And it, talks, it, it feels particularly dangerous to talk about Israeli government policies and Israeli military actions that are really causing great harm to Palestinian human beings. And yet, this is an organization that's dedicated to having these conversations, to having them openly and honestly, so that we hopefully can bring about a different kind of reality, one that would be um, a, a, a just and shared society for all of the people who are living in that land. So we are deeply moved um, to have you with us tonight. And, um, and we're gonna start the evening by hearing from the New Israel Fund's own Rabbi Ephraim Pelkovitz, who's going to um, frame for us the, the, the film that we're about to see. And then we're gonna have, a, uh, after about a 22 minute film, we're gonna have a discussion um, with two of the folks from Breaking the Silence who are here with us today. And let me just say that, um, that Ephraim is both a colleague and a friend, and he is the director of um, the Los Angeles and Southern California region of the New Israel Fund, which you'll hear more about later tonight. So thank you for being here, Ephraim. Thanks so much, Rabbi Braus, for that warm welcome. It's uh, humbling and an honor to be welcomed into the space by you, someone who's 
given so much of your leadership to this city, to our com Jewish community, to the broader American Jewish community. And I really, I wanna thank a big thanks to the ECAR staff who made everything happen tonight. Um, we're down to just me right now and IFLA. So if anyone knows a wonderful assistant associate director person, I'm all ears. But um, ECAR stepped into this void and I'm, I'm really, really grateful for all of the ECAR folk who made tonight happen. I also really, I wanna thank Benzi and Maya, who you, bios you'll hear later in the evening, but who are visiting us and representing Breaking the Silence. Your courage, to have come forward and to make this trip and to tell your story as painful as it is to audiences both in Israel who will learn, often don't know what the occupation looks like and also to um, American Jewish audiences and make sure they understand the full picture of what Israel looks like. It's um, really, really important to us. Um, and it's strange to be focusing in on one element of the challenges Israeli democracy is facing today, uh, just two and a half weeks after a really painful election there. We saw what can only be described as a defeat of the left and a rise of very far right parties. And it's a tough and painful time. And um, I must confess that there are moments where I feel beaten down in this moment. And then I pick up the phone and I talk to colleagues in Israel who are actually doing the work and they don't take a moment off. They dive right back in. They say, you know, this is what we know how to do. We've been, we've worked in the opposition. We've had governments who don't like us and yet we still continue to fight for a more just society. We still fight for a more shared society. And I realize when I see people like Benzi and Maya who don't give up and are actually living in Israel that I also don't have that luxury of giving up. Um, and at the same time, um, the occupation under a more right-wing government certainly isn't going to get better. So it behooves us to listen carefully and to understand what that, what that looks like. And we'll hear kind of Benzi and Maya's thoughts about opportunities and challenges that this moment in particular will present to us. Um, just to give a little bit more context to this film, I wouldn't be standing here this evening representing NIF, representing the New Israel Fund, had I not taken a trip with Breaking the Silence to Chevron in the winter of 2008. Uh, I was there as a rabbinical student and it was really an important part of um, kind of bringing my understanding of what the modern state of Israel is to a fuller, a fuller sense. And I, and I took that trip and there are images from that day in, in Hebron and there are sounds that stick with me to today. And I, we won't obviously in this room be taking that trip but you're in a sense uh, taking that journey for 20 minutes. This is an incredibly powerful and really superbly put together short documentary by an Israeli producer that takes you into the heart of the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank in the Southern part of the West Bank into Hebron and to see what kind of the mechanics of occupying, of having a military occupation of a large city looks like. And it's not an easy film to watch. Um, I encouraged my eighth grader, Alexander, to be here. I know Rabbi Braus, his eighth grader, is here. So, we, you know, we feel, uh, you know, the 13-year-olds can take this in, but it's, it's, it's hard stuff to hear, and we'll have the opportunity to think about those issues, to explore those issues with three people I really trust and I, I have tremendous faith in, and I look forward to looking at this and watching this documentary with you and to continuing the conversation about um, the details of that occupation with, uh, with Rabbi Braus, with Benzi, with Maya, and uh, continuing the conversation with all of you after the film, kind of over cookies and coffee, and, uh, and about the broader picture of what NIF does to help build a more just and a more shared future for everyone living in Israel and Palestine. So without any further ado, I think we're gonna get the, uh, get the documentary rolling. אני לואיס אברבוך, בן 27, אני עולה מברזיל והתגייסתי ב-2014 לגדוד נחשון בחטיבת כפיר. היה לך איזה שהן מחשבות בנושא של החשיפה? בלדבר פה? 
בהחלט, חשבתי על זה הרבה. כי, אני לא יודע, את יודעת, לא כולם, לא כולם תופסים את זה כמשהו טוב, לא כולם רושמים שזה... אוקיי, okay, אז uh, ניצן רון, שירתתי בגדוד 50, הייתי בחברון בקיץ 2016. אני צריך לשבת ככה, אני יכול לשבת ככה. <אח> קוראים לי רון זיידל. בחברון שירתתי שתי תקופות, כלוחם וכמפקד בגדוד, הייתי סמל צלפים. אני יוני, יונתן סטירמן, והייתי בחברון כמעט שישה חודשים. <אח> אני התגייסתי בגלל... ציונות והחיפוש למשהו משמעותי, כן. קוראים לי דיני סחרוף ואני הייתי קצין בגדוד 932 בנחל ושירתתי בחברון. אני נדב ביגרון, שירתתי בגדוד 50 בחברון ובארנטיס. מתחילים? כן. מערת המכפלה, כאן קבורים לפי המסורת אברהם ושרה, יצחק ורבקה, יעקב ולאה. בזכותו של כל יהודי לגור בכל חלק מארץ ישראל ובפרט בחברון עיר האבות. בחודש אב, תרפ"ט, 53 מהרוגי טבח חברון הובאו לקבורה בקבר אחים. צה"ל כבש את חברון בלי קרב, ומפתחות מערת המכפלה נמסרו לידיו. קריית ארבע היא חברון, כפי שנזכר בתנ״ך. אני חושבת שעם ישראל היום עשה לו ניצחון גדול. על מדרגות מערת המכפלה פסל לפנות בוקר ברוך גולדשטיין והחל לירות בלא הבחנה. ברוך השטיין! בחברון האופן שבו המשימה בעצם מנוסחת זה להגן על תושבי היישוב היהודי בחברון. אתה שומע שם פשוט על יהודים שגרים בחברון. זאת המשימה ש... היחידה שלך. לשמור ולהגן על היישוב היהודי בעיר חברון, לאפשר אורח חיים תקין לכלל המתיישבים. נראה לי שעשיתי את זה נכון עדיין. צריך להבין שבחברון כל השטח הוא מאוד מאוד דחוס. תחשבי שיש לך 850 יהודים שיושבים באמצע עיר פלסטינית. ואז מה שאנחנו כצבא נרצה לעשות זה בעצם לייצר אה, צירים או, מר... או מתחמים סטריליים בכל מקום שיש בו מתנחלים. ציר סטרילי זה בעצם ציר שפשוט נקי מפלסטינים. ככל שמתקרבים להתנחלות, אז הסטריליזציה נהיית יותר נוקשה. אתה ערבי? אתה יודע ערבי. מפה, מנון? רק יהודים. למה? קפטן? נחליט. סטטית זה עמדה שאתה פשוט עומד בה בצורה סטטית ושומר. שש שש, זה נקרא בעצם שש שעות שמירה, שש שעות מנוחה. שמונה שמונה, ארבע ארבע, שמונה שש עשרה. It's nothing, there's nothing happening. זה נורא, ואין דבר יותר גרוע משעמום לחיילים. כאילו, הזמן עובר יותר לאט, לא רואים דברים, לא עושים שום דבר, אין אקשן. ופשוט צריך לתצפת. Aware and attentive and looking around. והמשימה השנייה זה באמת לעצור לבידוק כל פלסטיני או פלסטינית שמגיעה. זה שעושים אה, חיפוש על מישהו שפשוט בוחרים מהרחוב, אה, רנדומלי. <laughs> אנחנו בגדול מנסים, עוצים את כולם. יש חייל אחד ששם עליו קנה של נשק בזווית, וחייל אחר שניגש אליו. כמה זמן כל הסיטואציה הזאת קורה? אה, כמה זמן שאני ארצה אם זה גבר, אז אנחנו ממש עוצים אותו ובודקים. בבדיקה זה הולך מ... יכול ללכת מ... להוריד נעליים, לבדוק באמת מכנסיים, כיסים, להרים חולצה. זה דורש לגעת בבן אדם, לעצור אותו, לגעת בו, לשים אותו על, על קיר, שישים ידיים, לפתוח רגליים עכשיו. אתה אמור לגעת בבן 
בביצים של אנשים זרים? אה, בביצים? לא, לא נוגעים להם בביצים. שם הייתי מחבאת הסכין. זה פחות כדי למצוא את הסכין. כאילו, כשצריך למצוא את הסכין, אז יש מגנומטרים. המטרה של זה, זה להביא את החיכוך אליהם, ואז שהם יורידו את הראש. טרול זה בעצם קבוצה של חיילים שמסתובבים אה, בתוך שכונה שנקראת הקסבה המערבית. והרעיון של הפטרולים זה לפטרל, כלומר זה בעצם להיות בכל מיני מקומות שפלסטינים לא יכולים לצפות שאתה תהיה שם. אז אה, אנחנו נכנסנו בדרך כלל לבתים של משפחות. We would like to talk about it and say, let us say, we're going on the roof. היה איזה בית ספציפית שכל הזמן 24 שבע היו חיילים אה, בגג של הבניין. אה, המשפחה הם כבר היו רגילים לזה. טוב, חיילים עוד פעם. ו... אבל יום אחד, האבא של המשפחה, הוא, הוא רצה לעלות לגג כדי, לא יודע, לטעות בגדים, ואז הוא הסתכל עליי כזה, למה אתם היום בבית שלי? כאילו, מה אני עשיתי לכם? כאילו, אני לא קשור לזה. ואני הבנתי אותו. שבע חיילים עם M16 על הבית שלו, מה, הוא יגיד משהו? מי יגיד? צ'ק פה זה סוג של... מחסום, אבל מחסום די ארעי ונייד. פורסים דוקרנים. עוצרים את המכוניות, יוצרים פקק עצום, ואז כזה בקצב שלך את בודקת כל מכונית. גורמים לבן אדם להביא תעודת זהות, הופכים את האוטו, 99 אחוז של הפעמים לא מוצאים שום דבר. לייצר איזושהי מין תחושת נרדפות כזאת, כלומר שאתה הולך לבית ספר בבוקר, פגשת את החיילים והצ'ק פוסט, בערב אתה הולך לארוחת ערב ופתאום פגשת את זה עוד פעם, וזה מין... בכל מקום נמצא כזה. לפעמים אם אני אראה רכב סובארו כזה לבן, עם הצבע מתקלף, וארבע גברים חסונים נמצאים בתוכו, אז אני אגיד, או, oh, את זה אני אעצור. כי זה נראה כמו כל המכוניות עם מחבלים שראיתי בסרטים בילדות. האוטו נראה קצת חשוד, הבן אדם שנוהג הוא נראה קצת, קצת עצבני. ולפעמים אומרים, סתם, באנדנדינו. אין פה תכנון. כרגע אנחנו פה בפעילות, וכרגע הוא לא נוסע ברחוב הזה. אז עשינו צ'ק פוסט באמצע הלילה, עצרנו מכונית, והיא הייתה פלסטינית, אבל היא ביקרה בני דודים שלה, והיא הייתה מארצות הברית בכלל. והיא פחדה בטירוף. עכשיו, אני למדתי בתיכון בארצות הברית, אז אני אומר לה, listen, everything's gonna be okay, this is just like a standard check. וה... הקטע הזה של השפה, שכאילו, פתאום זה נהיה שיחה בין שני אמריקאים שיכלה לקרות בקניון, כאילו. לא יודע, אני לא יודע אם הייתי יכול לעשות את כל המשימות שעשיתי אם לכל הפלסטינים היו מבטא אמריקאי. כשאתה חייל בחברון, הרבה מהמעצרים שאתה עושה זה מעצרים שאתה עושה על הדרך. זה יכול להיות תוך כדי פטרול או תוך כדי איזושהי פעילות אחרת. זה בעצם מעצרים שאין שום מודיעין על הבן אדם שאתה עוצר. אז איך מחליטים את המעצרים? כולם חשודים. כלומר, זו התפיסה הביטחונית. כל פלסטיני שם הוא מחבל בפוטנציה. עכשיו, אם הוא מתחצף אלייך, אז התגובה הראשונית זה מי אתה בכלל שתתחצף אליו. ואז מה שאפשר לעשות זה לשלוף אותו מהשכונה, לשים אותו בעמדה עם חייל, ואז לייבש אותו עם ידיים אזוקות ויושב. ומשם זה הולך למשטרה, ואז זה כבר לא בטיפולנו. יש איזו הגבלת גיל במעצרים? אני בתור חייל פשוט לא קיבלתי אף פעם איזושהי פקודה את מי אפשר לעצור מבחינת גיל ואת מי לא. בן כמה היה הילד הכי צעיר שעצרת? בן עשר, אולי פחות אפילו. יזומות זה איזושהי... הגדלת ראש לצורך העניין של הצבא, להרחיב עוד יותר את um, הנראות שלך בשטח. מעצר, סריקות אמל"ח, מיפויים, לא יודע מה. זה איפה שיש את כל, ה... כל האקשן ואיפה ש... שבאמת עושים משהו. בדרך כלל זה יזומה לילית. סוגרים על הבית, מה שנקרא, שזה ממש חלוקה לזוגות, שכל זוג סוגר על הצלע של הבית. כל חוליה יש לה את התפקיד שלה, אם היא חוליית סגירה או חוליית פריצה. הכוח שאמור להיכנס, נכנס לתוך הבית, מתחיל בדרך כלל בדפיקות וכזה להעיר את האנשים. זה לא סתם להעיר אנשים, זה עם הכתות ולצעוק. נכנסים לבתים ובאמת הופכים את הכל אם יש צורך. 
בדרך כלל האבא עונה, ואומרים לו, תאסוף את כל המשפחה, שים אותם בסלון. יש את החייל או שניים ששומרים עליהם. ומתחילים לחפש, להפוך הכל, להפוך ארונות, על הגן, ברמת הלשבור דברים, לשבור קירות, ממש להשאיר את הבית כאילו הפוך. ידעת מה אתה מחפש? לא, הרבה פעמים לא. הרבה פעמים לא ידעתי בכלל מה אני מחפש. זה לא שיש לנו מודיעין, זה לא שאמרו לנו לחפש אה, משהו ספציפי. תמיד מעלה שאלה, מה המטרה של זה, ומאיפה המידע. <laughs> כל סופה שהיה את אותן הפרות סדר, הפרות סדר זה הפגנות. כמו הזמנה בפייסבוק, שזה אנשים יודעים בדיוק מה הולך לקרות, באיזה שעה זה הולך לקרות, איפה החיילים יעמדו, איפה הפלסטינים יעמדו. מפר מרכזי, מפר סדר מרכזי, יכול לקבל גומי. אתה עושה כל האימון לפני, נכון? אתה מתכונן, אתה מתאמן כמעט עשרה חודשים לפני. And you're just waiting for an opportunity to shoot. You're like, this is it. This is what I came here for. And the person who shoots, and the person who shoots, is a baktan. Because that's when you can actually shoot somebody. The men are really loving to see the gummy. It's a joke. The men want to hit what they say to him. You know, in the middle of the room, someone comes in, says, okay, I'm going to him. יורדת לקריאה, נותנת כדור, רואים אותו כזה מקפץ מכאב, או כזה מתחיל להתגלגל, וזהו, כולם כיפים כזה, איזה מלך, פגעת. המפקד שלי אמר לי, אתה יוצא ברחוב שם, והדבר הראשון שאתה רואה שזה אז, אתה יורד. ופתאום באה איזו קבוצה של צעירים, הייתי אומר, בגיל 17-16, התחילו... התחילו להפגין, התחילו לצעוק, התחילו לזעוק אבנים. פתאום הם ראו אותי, ראו שאני חייל ושאני עם נשק מכוון אליהם. נהיו לבנים כזה לגמרי, התחילו לרוץ כמו משוגעים. פגעת? אז זהו, אז זה היה כזה קצת בלגן, אני לא מאה אחוז בטוח, אני מאמין שכן. עומד. עומד. חטף. חטף. חטף ותחת. כן. בול בתחת. היה מין חדר כזה קטן שהיה צמוד להתנחלות באברהם אבינו והמתנחלים היו מביאים לשם עוגות ועוגיות והיה שם כזה מיחם לעשות קפה. התפקיד של המקום הזה זה באמת לפנק חיילים, הם היו מביאים טוסטים, שתייה קלה. החיילים יכולים להיכנס אליו במהלך היום, מתי שהם רוצים, לפני השמירה, אחרי השמירה, לפני הפטרול, אחרי הפטרול. And it was great, it was amazing. Because you, you, what do you eat all day? You eat like מלפפון או עגבניות, like ביצה אולי, לא יודע, like אתה בקושי אוכל. וזה המקום שהם יכולים לבוא ולשבת שם ולהירגע קצת. ולברוך מר זה לה קטע שהוא כזה הסתובב ומחלק קופונים לפיצה של מערת המכפלה אם אתה יורה בפלסטיני. הרבה ממה שאנחנו כחיילים עושים בחברון זה בעצם לאבטח אה, כל מיני אירועים שה... שהמתנחלים מארגנים. כל סופש בעצם מגיע תגבור לרוב טירונים. שנמצאים ממש כמה חודשים בצבא, בשביל אה, מה שנקרא לשרוול את ציר ציון, זאת אומרת לאבטח אותו, ממש עומדים חייל חייל ברווחים של כמה מטרים, מקריית ארבע ועד מערת המכפלה. עמדנו כל הכוחות, כאילו, במהלך הכביש הזה, כאילו, ב- בכל הדרך, וההערה העיקרית שלנו זה אף אחד לא מתקרב. מעיפים כמובן את כל הפלסטינים שמסתובבים שם, סוגרים את כל החנויות, זה אזור מסחרי, אז זה הכל מלא חנויות, סוגרים את כל החנויות. יוצרים את השרוול הזה עם חיילים שעומדים ומאבטחים. בתוך המקום הזה יש הרבה מאוד מתח והרבה מאוד איזושהי אינטנסיביות. כי המתנחלים יכולים להתהפך עליך, שאתה רגע לא נותן להם לעבור, או כן נותן להם לעבור, ולא כמו שהם רצו, ופתאום הם כבר לא החברים הכי טובים שמביאים לך את הקפה. שהבית של כולכם מסתרק מהבעזרת בשעות! הוא עם הנתי! בסדר! אתה שומע אותי? מה אתה רוצה מהחייל? מה אתה רוצה? סתם את הפעלה They instantly hate you. They feel that you're against them. They'll call you a Nazi. They like forgot everything we'd done beforehand. It was like, Parega is there, and he ain't a bugged. 
כי אתם שמאלנים, ולא יודע מה, וטה טה טה, ומתחילים לקלל אותנו, ומתחילים כאילו... מה נסגר? כאילו, אנחנו הצבא, כאילו, אתה מבין? אנחנו, אנחנו צה"ל, מה, מה אתה עושה? כל הקצינים של הפלוגה נקראו לבית הדסה, והאחראית על החינוך נכנסת, והיא אומרת, תקשיבו, איזה מתוקים שבאתם, איזה מזל שאני פוגשת אתכם, רציתי להגיד לכם משהו. נורא מלחיץ להיות ילד יהודי בחברון. אז אם אתם רואים אותם, עושים כל מיני שטויות, אל תביאו אותם למשטרה. תביאו אותם אליי, ואני אחנך אותם. עכשיו, זאת אישה שיש כאילו אינסוף סרטונים שלה מרביצה לכל מיני פעילים ולפלסטינים ויורקת על אנשים ועיתונאים, אבל היא אחראית על חינוך בחברון. וכשהיא אומרת, רואים אותם עושים שטויות, אז מה שהיא מתכוונת זה זורקים אבנים לתוך השוק הפלסטיני, תוקפים פלסטינים, משתמשים בגז פלפל על פלסטינים ברחובות שלשניהם מותר ללכת. אין דבר כזה לעצור באמת ילד של יהודי שחי בחברון מלעשות משהו. אין דבר כזה לעצור יהודי מלעשות משהו. אם אתה רואה משהו של ישראלי שעושים משהו של פלסטיני, זה לא קשור אליך. בכלל, אתה פשוט מסתכל וזהו. תראי את הדלת. לשבת פה בכנסת. יאללה, אופי הביתה. שרמוטה. שרמוט. ואז מגיע פורים. אה, פורים. כן, אז הגיע פורים. Next to Beit Adasa, there are maybe 40 or 50 Israelis that were there. And then they start throwing bottles. at the Palestinian home, you know, it's very, very close, maybe like 20 meters away. They're throwing bottles, empty bottles, right? And they've been drinking all day. Okay, and then the windows, most of them are just bars, okay? And the bottle would hit the bar and then shatter. It would go into the house. And then we started hearing a baby cry, and we realized that one of the rooms was the baby's room. I wanted to, like, get involved. They're friends with each other, and they get there, they don't do anything. And then my mamem spoke to me, and he was like, I think it's best if you go back to Nitkanim um, until this is all over. So we left. <laughs> אני פה השרף, זוז בבקשה שני מטר הצידה. אני זה שקובע דברים פה כרגע. תקשיב, אוהד אומר ששני אלה עומדים כמו אתמול. מי זה אוהד? מי זה אוהד? אוהד זה הרב שץ פה, הוא זה שמחליט. רב שץ זה רכז ביטחון שוטף צבאי, אם אני לא טועה, זה הפירוש, זה בעצם מי שאמון מטעם המתנחלים על הביטחון השוטף בהתנחלות או במרחב הזה. הוא עובד בשיתוף פעולה עם הצבא, אבל לא אמורה להיות לו סמכות פיקודית. פתאום יש איזה אחד שהוא הראש הביטחון של איזה מקום. והוא נותן הערות. אני שומע בחסם אדום, מגיע פלסטיני עם חומרי בנייה, הוא יודע שאסור לו לעבור עם הרכב, את המחסום, אבל מותר להם לעבור רגלית. אנחנו מקבלים את האישור, ואז יוצא אחד מתושבי הבית האדום, שהוא גם היה רבשט של חברון וקריית ארבע, קצת מתעצבן עלינו, שהחומרים האלה בסוף יגרמו, יגרמו לו לבנות בית, שאנחנו נצטרך להרוס, והכל באשמתנו, ואז מרים טלפון, לא שם אותם בפייל, ופתאום... אין אישור אה, אה, לפלסטיני להמשיך אה, להעביר את החומרים. זה היה ברור ש- שאותו מתנחל, אותו רב שצ'קי, הוא קיבל את ההחלטה פה. אה, שהיא לא החלטה ביטחונית. כל המתנחלים שגרים שם, they would just come in through like the shin gimel, as if they live there. I remember one of them, הוא מברך על האוכל נאלי, אוקיי? הוא עושה, מה הוא אמר? הוא אמר, ברוך אתה אדוני, אני אומר לך, בה 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 בה, בן זונות הערבים. ולפעמים הם היו באים, ובאים, שערבים מחבלים. ותרביצו להם, ובאים הערות כאלה. זוכר אחד מהם עמד ליד העמדה ואמר, אתה יודע שאתה חייב לבדוק גם את התיקים של הילדים, נכון? היחס בין, ה... בין המתנחלים וה... והצבא. יש רגעים שלא הבנתי מי, מי באמת מביא את הפקודות. לא עם זה ברחוב שלנו, אסור לעבור עם זה ברחוב שלנו. 
חייל, בוא, אסור לה לעבור פה עם הכאפייה הזאת. אני תכף מוציא לך את שתי העיניים שלך, היא חתיכת זבל. זה החוק? כן. בואי אני אראה לך מה החוק. מה אתה מצלם? מה אני תפוס את הרגל? תפוס. כאילו, אני אגיד לך, דוגי, זה די הורס לי את היום לדבר על חברון. ככה זה מעלה את כל מה שלא בא לך לחשוב עליו ביום-יום. זה גם, אני תמיד חושב שאימא שלי הייתה... אם הייתה יודעת באמת מה עשיתי ואיפה הייתי, היא הייתה מביאה לי סטייה, היא לא הייתה... גם מבחינת ביטחוני וגם מבחינת עקרונית, כאילו, אני לא חושב ש... היא לא הייתה גאה? לא, היא גאה, היא בהחלט גאה, אבל, אבל יש דברים שהיא לא יודעת באמת. All right, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard to watch this. Um, I'm really grateful to Maya and Benzi for being with us now to help talk about your own experiences and some of the work. And um, before you leave tonight, we are going to talk about what we can all do about this. So um, however we're feeling in our bodies right now, I want to just invite us into this conversation. Um, We're here because we believe that there's a different way. Um, there's a different way to live and there's a different kind of society that can be built. And so um, I am very pleased to introduce you to Maya Eschel and to Benzi Sanders. I'll give a quick uh, intro to both um, and then you'll hear from them for a couple minutes each. We'll engage in conversation and then we'll have Q&A. So, Um, so folks can be in conversation. Maya is an Israeli-American anti-apartheid activist living in Tel Aviv. She gave testimony to Breaking the Silence in 2017 after she served uh, for nine months in the Etzion Brigade, Brigade headquarters in the West Bank in 2019 while speaking on panels with Breaking the Silence about her military service and the unlearning that she went through. Maya witnessed how storytelling can help build bridges 
can open minds and create new pathways toward community and growth. Maya is currently an activist, facilitator, and teacher focusing on supporting communities in Masa Feriata in the, in the South Chevron Hills. Um, and by the way, speaking of how storytelling builds bridges and opens minds and create new, creates new pathways, um, I'm so thrilled that some of our friends from Newground are here, some in person and some um, who are with us online tonight, um, because there's a very strong core community of Jews and Muslims in Los Angeles who are working to build bridges, share stories, and help build a different kind of reality here on the ground. And so I thank you for being with us um, tonight and look forward to more together as well. Benzie Sanders grew up in, in, ortho, in the Orthodox community on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, after graduating from a leading modern Orthodox high school in New York, he went to Israel, studied for three years in Yeshivot in Beit Shemesh and Malaya Dumim. In 2011, Benzi became an Israeli citizen and was drafted into the IDF, where he served in Sayyarat Nachal, Special Forces Unit between the years of 2012 and 2015. After a lengthy training, Benzi spent most of his service stationed in different parts of the West Bank, was also deployed into the northern Gaza Strip during the 2014 war. Following his service, he studied philosophy and Middle Eastern studies at Bar Ilan University and was an active member of the Meretz Party. Since 2020, he's been the Jewish Diaspora Education Coordinator at Breaking the Silence. We're really honored to have both of you with us this evening. Benzi? Oh, Maya. I just want to start by saying hi. Um, that I know, I'm sure... Um, Y'all said it, but that was a very intense film, and this is my second time watching it today, and I, I feel that was a lot for me, so maybe we can take a, a group breath. Um, hi, nice to see you all here today. I'm really happy you, you came. My name is Maya Eschel. I'm 27 years old. I grew up um, in New York on Long Island with an Israeli father and American mother. Um, in a very American Israeli like community, um, I always knew that at some point I would be spending time in Israel and, and maybe would join the military. Um, but then when I was 16 years old, in 2011, my parents decided to move us to Tel Aviv. Um, and all of a sudden I had to deal with learning the language and I'm trying to figure out the culture. And I was having a really, really hard time. I was really struggling finding my place there. Um, and when I would talk to friends and family about my struggles, they would all say, listen, you have two years and then you're joining the military. The high school is almost over and then you're going to be a part of something bigger. You're, you're going to get your ticket way into the Israeli society. So just, just hold on until you join the military. Don't worry. Um, and for me, that's all I wanted. I wanted to feel a part of something, a, f a sense of belonging. And, and so I was drafted into the military in 2014. Um, I served as a Mashakitash, which is a, non a human resources non-commissioning officer. Um, my job was to see the person behind the madim, behind the um, yo, uniform. uniform, thank you. <laughs> it happens. Um, and I was, I was supposed to be that empathetic person for soldiers on the base who were immigrants, who were coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, who had um, family members who were ill that they needed to take care of. I was that person that uh, no matter what was going on on the base or on the ground, they can come to me. Um, and, you know, I started my base in the south of the country and in 2015 I moved bases, um, I moved to the Khatmar Zion Brigade. Um, back then for me I called it Judea and Samaria, today I know, I know it as the West Bank. It's a base about 20 minutes um, south of Jerusalem. Um, and my mother in particular, when she knew I was moving bases, she was really, really nervous because I, I didn't really at the time understand where I was heading. I understood it was this place where there are a lot of uh, Arabs living and um, I didn't really know where I was going, but my mother specifically was like, get on the double armored uh, buses and don't talk to anyone. She was really anxious for me. And I also, I, I arrived to the base a bit anxious and a little excited. Um, my uh, fellow soldiers, when I got to the base, the first thing they would tell me is, uh, you know, down this little hill in the corner of the base, we have a detention center. There are, there are Palestinian detainees living here. Um, you got to check it out at some point. And uh, because we had this detention center on our base, 
I, I got used to seeing Palestinians being walked into the base, going through the clinic and then going to the detention center. Um, they were always blindfolded, always uh, handcuffed with their hands behind their back. Um, and they, they were anything from young boys um, aged between 8 and 12 to, to older men. And I, I, that was just a constant occurrence, always seeing these guys being walked in. And, you know, one day I was sitting at the clinic about to go see the doctor, and in walks a young Palestinian boy. He also could have been anything between 8 to 12 years old, um, ha uh, blindfolded and handcuffed. And he was being walked in by this really, like, this uh, officer that I personally was afraid of, that I knew is, like, he's an he's a intimidating guy. And they walk up to me. Um, they're going to cut the line to go to the doctor. Um, and they're stopping and waiting in front of me to, to see the clinician. And um, I, I freak out. Like, this kid who is just a few centimeters higher than me, taller than me, while I'm sitting down, I'm afraid that he can see me through his blindfold. I'm afraid that he's going to recognize my face, that he's going to try to retaliate, that he's going to track me down. And in my brain, if he is here, he's done something that means he, he's supposed to be here in this, in this, uh, on this space. Um, and uh, fast forward um, a year or so, I am released from the military in 2016. And, I decide I want to come back to the States and look at universities. And I'm, I'm in this class seeing what, it, what it's like, what it could be like. And all of a sudden, I hear the teacher and the students say the word um, Israel and the IDF and the occupation. And all of a sudden, I, I, I take a breath and I, I realize everyone here in this room knows something that I don't. They're talking about this place that my, my country, they're talking about something that I was just a part of. Like, what is going on? What do I not know? What, am I in the wrong? What, what is this conversation? I really, really started to panic. I felt like everyone was looking at me like they all knew where I've been for the past few years. I run out of the classroom and just have a, have a bit of a breakdown. Um, and in that moment, I, I think back to that, that boy. Um, and I realized that when I was serving, I only saw myself and I only saw my fear, but really all of a sudden I thought about this kid for the first time I could think about him and I was thinking, you know, who was this kid? Where were his parents? They must have been freaking out. They had no idea where he was. He's alone in the space. Um, what is he experiencing and what could he have actually done to, um, to justify this type of treatment to a little, little kid. And I also thought about all the other Palestinians I saw walking into my base. And one time I walked into a detention center. I did go visit the detention center. And, and what could have those guys have done? And, and you know, that was also like this kind of ex, uh, experience. We treated the detention center as kind of like this like adventure. You go in and you go out. And all of a sudden I, I realized, you know, this empathy that I was supposed to have towards human beings on my base, I couldn't, I didn't have that when I was serving in the military towards Palestinians walking into the, into my base. And, um, I realized that's, that's a really big problem. Um, and so I decided to go back to Israel and, and do my own research. Um, and over the course of, um, a few phone calls and um, trying to trying to make sense of things, I ended up speaking with someone who works for Breaking the Silence, and a few months later, I decided to give testimony in 2017. Um, and you know, for me, Breaking the Silence has been a place that it, it's it's created a sense of community for me. They've really helped me with my political education, and also, um, so it's it's just been so important for me to meet other people who have who have been uh, disillusioned. Um, but also served, and um, so uh, and slowly they, um, I found my way into the world of activism, and and you know five six years later I'm here speaking in the United States to uh, folks like y'all. So thank you for for coming, and thank you for listening. Thank, thanks, Maya, and thank you, Rabbi Braus, and thank you all also for coming. My name is Ben C. Sanders. Um, and I served in an infantry unit um, called Sayeret Nachal. It's a special forces reconnaissance unit between the years 2012 and 2015. And then for many years afterwards as, as, an, as a reservist. 
Um, and uh, as Rabbi Braus mentioned, I grew up in New York in an Orthodox uh, community. Basically, the way I went from uh, growing up Orthodox in New York to being in a Special Forces IDF unit was these years that I spent in yeshiva on a gap year, st starting out on a gap year program, which were really transformative for me. I really um, started connecting much, much on a much deeper level to Jewish tradition, to our religious texts. Uh, I began to appreciate in a very deep way just how significant the creation of the state of Israel was for the Jewish people and Jewish history, the fact that there was a thriving and safe space for Jewish people to live in in the land of Israel um, was something my ancestors couldn't have even dreamed of. And um, I felt really obligated to, to be part of that. And I decided that I wanted to make Aliyah to become an Israeli citizen. I knew that would mean I would have to serve in the IDF. And that was something I also viewed really as a privilege and an honor because I knew everything that was taking place was only possible because Israel had a very strong military that had stood time and time again against invading armies and in more recent years had stood against horrific terrorist attacks, suicide bombs, shootings in cafes and um, stabbings. And um, I figured if I'm going to serve in the military, I want to do it in the most meaningful way and make the most significant contribution. And that's how, after I was drafted into the infantry unit, I tried out for the special forces um, and I was accepted. I was really thrilled uh, to have that opportunity. I began 14 months of specialized training, which is twice as long as the typical infantry unit, a lot of advanced navigation training. Uh, my unit was designed to really uh, do all sorts of different types of warfare, um, be at the front of a larger force, be able to move undetected and to pinpoint exactly where enemy forces are to direct airstrikes and artillery strikes. Um, and once we finished our training, we got our first assignment and we were sent to the West Bank. And, you know, you saw this film, this was really focused in Hebron. Um, I served for eight months in the West Bank between the end of 2013 till the summer of 2014. And um, even though I only served for maybe two or three days in Hebron, um, my experiences, the, the experiences shared by the soldiers in the film, um, who, by the way, it wasn't mentioned in the film, all six of the soldiers interviewed are breaking the silence testifiers, um, really resonate with me very deeply. Um, because what I was tasked with doing, it was explained to me very, very early on that most of our training, most of the 14 months of training that we had done was not going to be really relevant during this deployment to the West Bank. We were going to be doing what's called routine security. It wasn't wartime. And we had to actually learn a whole new set of skills for, this, for the sake of this deployment. We, for the first time, learned how to make arrests. We, for the first time, learned how to use, use tear gas and how to fire rubber-coated bullets. Some of those uh, images and videos uh, really are rep rem reminiscent of things I did um, in the north of, northern part of the West Bank. Um, we were told every Friday um, there's a protest in the area where we're being stationed. We were stationed in a settlement called Kudumim, and um, Kudumim lies right in between a small village, Palestinian village called Kadum, and the much larger Palestinian city of Nablus. And uh, at some point, many years before I was sent to this area, the IDF shut down the road. They turned the road in between, leading from the village to the city into a sterile road, just like you saw that was taking place in Hebron. Um, and the Palestinians, because of the inconvenience uh, that that uh, caused them in their daily lives, not being able to drive to the, to the city, they began doing a protest march every Friday. And our job was to show up and make sure that they don't get on the road. And to that, to, in order to accomplish that, we would fire tear gas. Um, the, the protesters would start throwing rocks at us. We would fire rubber-coated bullets at the knees or below of the central instigators. Um, we would do the patrols the same way were described in the film. We would do them in armored jeeps instead of by foot because the settlement was a little bit more um, in an, an open area. We would, we would be tasked with guarding perimeter of a sterile zone around the settlement called red lines that were being constantly monitored by cameras. Um, and I found myself in one, one situation um, with, uh, um, as on the rapid response team, responding to you know, uh, surveillance cameras spotting two Palestinian, a man and a woman, uh, who had crossed the red line in this 
olive grove that was, you know, hundreds of meters away from the last house in the settlement and confronting them and telling them they had crossed the red line, that there was, there was no physical demarcation, but this was a, an area that was off limits to Palestinians. And so I found myself with two friends, fully armed, with, you know, mag six magazines in my vest and my assault rifle, telling a middle-aged Palestinian couple that they could not continue to gather leaves and they had to go back to their village or else uh, we would arrest them. I, I very briefly touch on a lot of testimonies that I shared with Breaking the Silence, uh, just to give you a sense of how not unique Hebron is. Hebron is um, is the only Palestinian uh, uh, is the only Israeli settlement that's inside of a Palestinian city, and that's why. Um, it's a very useful uh, educational tool for us at Breaking the Sounds. We take so many people on tours there because you can really observe so many different um, military practices and different manifestations of the military rule in a very short time and space, but in no way is it unique. Uh, as someone who spent eight months serving in other parts of the West Bank, um, I can really attest to that. My, the final things I wanna say about, uh, about the film before we start uh, with some questions, is, um, you know, uh, the uh, Israeli elections, um, I'm sure many of you have been following them uh, to various degrees, um, resulted in the resounding victory of some of the most extremist, uh, racist, uh, um, violent, terrorist-supporting uh, Israeli parties. The Jewish Power Party, led by Itamar Ben-Gvir, uh, is expected to be appointed to an, a senior ministerial position. Um, and while uh, none of us at Breaking the Sounds would wish that this was the case, um, this is something we've been warning against for so long. Um, this film was, was you know, uh, made many, you know, uh, almost a year, almost two years ago, and the soldiers who served in them served through, uh, uh, spread out through over a decade of, of, of time. And basically what we've been trying to bring to the fore, both in the Israeli public and the American Jewish community, is that the ideology of these extremist uh, settler groups is what actually the state, the entire state of Israel has been carrying out by sending the IDF to carry out these, these policies. And uh, for many, our, our greatest uh, struggle and challenge is coming to the Israeli public and to the international community and especially the Jewish diaspora and people saying, no, your experience is not reflective of what Israel means to me or what I think Israel is or um, what I wish Israel was. And they kind of compartmentalize away our testimonies um, and, um, and, and, don't really, uh, and don't really give it the, um, the significance that it does play. Every year we're sending tens of thousands of soldiers to do exactly what you saw in this film. Um, and breaking the silence, um, has since 2004 uh, gathered testimonies from today close to 1400 IDF veterans to show that reality to the public and show the moral cost of continued military occupation. We take thousands of people on, on tour, we publish booklets of testimonies which you can find on your, on your chairs. And uh, the reason we're doing this is not just to educate people, but really to galvanize and to inspire and motivate people uh, to use this knowledge and use these testimonies and use this perspective to take action uh, because none of this is possible without uh, the support of the international community and in particular the Jewish diaspora in all sorts of different levels of advocacy and support. Um, the settler, settlement community which whose ideology is behind what's going on in Hebron today and going on in other parts of the West Bank, um, they're sending lobbyists to Washington DC on a, you know every every couple of months um, they're raising millions of dollars uh, in you know the diaspora communities and uh, because this is uh, you know uh, all taking place um, it, in ways that is supported outside of the the, the borders of Israel um, we feel like we need to come and we also need to make our voices heard in these spaces um, and we're very very grateful to the partnership of the new Israel fund um, which supports us and uh, a whole ecosystem of partners, partner organizations that are shining lights on this, Israeli um, human rights groups, uh, to try to galvanize and to really fight and change this reality. And I think that at this moment where what we've been warning against so long is, is finally coming in a way that's really undeniable uh, into the public light, 
I think this is not a time to throw up our hands in despair, but rather a time to double down on our commitment to uh, making people who are in a position to actually take action and change the reality, to say you cannot deny this and you cannot compartmentalize this away anymore. Well, thank you for saying that, Amen. Um, I, it's, uh, it's painful to hear that when you come to share these stories with American Jews, that American Jews think that you're lying, um, think that it's just not true. And that's because it doesn't align with, uh, with a lot of the narrative that we have been telling and, and tell ourselves um, about the state of Israel, the most moral army in the world. Um, and, and I think I, I want to, if insofar as, as Zionism and the establishment of the state of Israel is really a response to Jewish powerlessness and lack of agency throughout history, um, many, many people in the Jewish community in Israel and in the diaspora feel very proud of the IDF and feel really proud that after so many years of exile and persecution and genocide that we can actually defend ourselves as a people. I think it's really a cognitive dissonance to try to square that really profound need that history has established uh, over, you know, again and again um, across time and space with the reality of what some of these military actions look like. And I wonder if you could speak to the difference um, between a kind of legitimate um, self-protection that, that the state of Israel um, n needs in order to protect itself um, from harm and and the, the resourcing of, of military uh, forces in occupied territories in order to basically serve the bidding of the, of the settlement enterprise. Can you make that distinction for this, uh, for this room today? Yeah, um, I, what? Yeah, I can, um, I can definitely speak to that. I mean, um, I'll, I'll also just, you know, if it, if it wasn't clear from what I said, Breaking the Silence is not a pacifistic organization. We don't, um, we're not questioning, of course, the legitimacy of the, of the existence of the state of Israel by any stretch, and we uh, defend Israel's right to defend itself. Um, but what we are trying to shine a light on is that so much of what Israel is doing in the occupied territories and the decision, the policy decision to continue the occupation is not just about security or not about security primarily at all. Um, an example of, um, you know, something that is very dear to my heart in terms of Israel's safety and support, um, and I think Maya can also shed a little bit of light on this, is, um, you know, uh, I served in the Gaza War in 2014, which, um, you know, uh, resulted in, in, in the killing of, um, the deaths of uh, hundreds of innocent Palestinian civilians, and I saw the bombardment of those areas uh, very close up. I saw entire residential neighborhoods nearly being flattened. Um, and also soldiers from my own unit uh, and units that were serving close to me were targeted and dozens of them were killed. One of the reasons that so many Israeli soldiers were killed was because the armored personnel carriers uh, had very thin armor and some of them were stri struck by missiles and uh, many soldiers were killed. And after the war, uh, the Israeli uh, military with US uh, funding uh, purchased many new um, and much more heavily armored uh, armored personnel carriers that were uh, manufactured in the United States. And that's something that obviously as a soldier, as somebody who was in those, uh, in those positions, I'm, gl I'm glad that Israeli soldiers are safe um, and, and safer and less vulnerable. Yet um, in one of the areas that we lead so many tours on, uh, the South Hebron Hills, Masafer Yatta, uh, this is a part of the West Bank where uh, like almost 18% of the West Bank as part of the Israeli strategy to take over and annex in practice, even if not uh, in declaration, we'll, we'll see how that long that lasts. But um, uh, they have declared 18% of the West Bank to be training zones for the IDF. Um, and in order to clear those areas for the IDF to do training exercises in, they have issued demolition orders and uh, issued expulsion orders for entire villages. Uh, in Masafar Yatta, one of the areas under threat right now, there's 1,300 pal Palestinians in eight separate villages that are facing imminent expulsion. Um, this is the area that Maya uh, serves in, and perhaps she can add a little bit about that. But um, just a few months ago, I saw Israeli uh, infantry and combat engineering uh, forces doing exercises there. I did my own, some of my own training there. I didn't even realize at the time. And I saw these very same Namer armored personnel carriers driving right next to villages, 
destroying cultivated fields, stopping kids on their way to school. And so this is um, a use of a very valid and just like so much of what the IDF does and the, and, and the IDF, I want to be proud of the IDF. I think that uh, uh, Lewis in the film uh, spoke about that very well, about his mom being proud of him. We, I want to be proud of the IDF. I want the IDF to be strong and, and to be able to protect Israel, but I want everyone who uh, is willing to listen and is in a position to do anything about it, to do everything they can to stop Israel from using this legitimate and important military force to trample uh, the lives of Palestinians living in the occupied territories. Um, I just wanted to add a few small things. Basically, as, as Bensi said, Breaking the Silence, we're not a pacifist uh, organization. Uh, we believe in protecting our borders, like every country. Um, but what we're essentially doing in uh, the occupied territories is controlling millions of people, uh, unwilling, against their will. Um, and as, you, as you've heard, I work in Masafiriata. It's um, an area where uh, there are about 29 Palestinian villages in Area C. Um, and the, the IDF has, um, is constantly present in the Palestinians' lives in this specific area. Um, and uh, Bensi was talking about the, the tank and uh, a a a C APCs, um, but I have, a, I have a friend who's a teacher in, um, in the firing zone in one of these Palestinian villages. And um, because this area was declared a firing zone and, and they're trying to slowly kick people out and expel them from their homes, they also want to just make their lives harder. And so they are putting up checkpoints in every entrance to every village and on every main road. Um, and my friend uh, Mahmoud, he was on his way to um, uh, teach in the morning and, and all of a sudden he sees a few soldiers, they're creating a flying checkpoint, just a checkpoint that they just decided, okay, we're gonna stop people, check their IDs. They ended up de um, detaining him and his fellow teachers for three hours in the sun. Um, one of the, they uh, confiscated one of the cars that, that normally takes them from their homes to the, t to the school and just disrupted their lives. Um, and this is what we're sending our soldiers to do. Um, in the West Bank on a daily basis. Um, in addition, um, I work in a, in a village where on a daily basis you hear drones being um, like uh, flying above the village. And basically what that is is settlers checking um, to see, checking on the Palestinians. And, and this is a legal thing. They're allowed to fly drones over Palestinian villages. Um, and what they're doing is they're checking to see if they're building illegally. And, and then they call the military and the military comes and, and, and um, gives out demol uh, orders of demolition. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, those, those are like the daily activities of soldiers in the West Bank. And uh, people need to understand, obviously this is an amazing film, but um, this is what we're sending our, our children to be doing. I wanna, I wanna talk about fear. Um, if we can for a moment, and I, I know um, we're, in a couple minutes we're going to turn to questions that you might have um, as well. So please think of of what you'd like to ask. Um, so you mentioned being afraid, and such a vivid story that you tell Maya of being afraid of an eight to twelve year old child with a blindfold on, right? Who must be such a violent kid? Otherwise, why would he be there? Um, you talked about being afraid of a middle-aged Palestinian um, couple that's walking into a field. And I remember um, years ago, a, a friend's uh, daughter was on a trip to Israel, and there was a group of um, of Jews, of Isra Israeli Jews and Palestinians who got together, and they did one of those get in a circle and step in, step out. And the question was, um, if you are afraid when you hear Arabic being spoken, step in. And all of the Jewish kids stepped in. And then they said, if you're afraid when you hear Hebrew being spoken, step in. And all of the Palestinian kids stepped in. And the Jewish kids were shocked. And they're like, why are you afraid of Hebrew? Like Hebrew, like we're not hurting anybody. And they realized that they have like, like really inverted understandings of one another. And obviously fear is, such, is a precondition for, um, you know, for, for, for violence and violent behavior. 
I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about the nature of fear. And it seems from the from the video and from what I've learned and heard and read from um, from folks who've given testimony over the many years that so much of, of this is about creating a, a sense of persecution, as it says in the film, or creating a sense of fear among the Palestinian population in the West Bank, so that they do, so there's a sense like so you won't act out. It's a kind of preemptive action. Um, if you're afraid that the soldiers are right just nearby, um, then you won't then you won't act. And and so there's a kind of psychological warfare to build a sense of fear uh, within a population. Can you just would would either or both of you be able to address that for a moment? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. There's a lot like fear is. I mean, obviously, as an Israeli, also living in Jerusalem, raising you know a one year old daughter there, like. Um, you know, I, I, when I, when you read about these escalations, you read about the terrorist attacks. Of course, that fear is coming from us, uh, affecting us as well, and we're empathetic with that. Um, living, living uh, in in this country, in that country, we're not there now. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that as a combat soldier, especially like I saw people so terrified of me going into homes, going into neighborhoods in the middle of the night, waking people up, waking them you know, at gunpoint out of their bed. Um, some of the testimonies that we've collected uh, more recently uh, talk about new ways of intimidation that are coming in. Um, we actually had uh, a bunch of testifiers in the past like two and three years talking about a new system that's been put in place that you know, on the on the check check uh, on the patrols and the flying checkpoints that people set up, um, they were uh, the soldiers were given these special smartphones, and they were told that you have to stop people and 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 check their ID and take a picture of their ID and then take a picture of their face, um, and this system was called the Blue Wolf system, um, and basically. Uh, those photographs were entered into it and there's facial recognition technology and they're basically trying to create a database with all the Palestinians in the West Bank um, and in order to do so they would have competitions between units who can collect the most uh, amount of uh, uh, they call them matches hatsmadot in Hebrew to match a face to an ID number um, and uh, you know soldiers describe you know stopping sometimes they stop the kids and the kids like you know do a peace sign, but the adults are, um, uh, are, are, they understand that they're, you know, being subject to an extremely invasive surveillance uh, system where there are cameras in every, you know, five inches in the West Bank um, that are being equipped with facial recognition technology, um, and they're, they don't want to be photographed, but the soldiers force them to stand and photograph their face. Um, and that is something that was very sickening for some of our, our recent testifiers. Um, uh, you actually, we, you can actually read about this system a little bit more in the Washington Post. Uh, they interviewed a number of our testifiers and published it recently. But it's definitely a huge part of what I I is necessary for the occupation to continue. Noth you know, we talk about the uh, the most moral army in the world. Uh, it's the only army I served in. I can't compare it to other armies. I know that you know other armies, including of Western countries, including the United States, have done terrible things. Um, uh, you know, in various uh, conflicts. Um, our criticism is not against the IDF um, for specific policies. That's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to change specific um, military practices um, because we know that um, in order to control millions of people against force, you need this fear, this mass fear. There's no such thing as controlling millions of people against their will with surgical strikes all the time. You need to instill the sense of persecution against a, a broad population of uninvolved or uh, uh, civilians. Uh, and that's what that looks like. And that's what we're trying to show people. Great answer. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm trying right now to wrap my head around what what fear I want to talk about, you know, is whether it's my mother's fear and her fear of coming, uh, uh, addressing this uh, issue without feeling like it's just too complex and too much to talk about, or the fear that I sense from uh, my uh, friends in Tel Aviv when I tell them that I'm, uh, I work in Masafriata in the West Bank and that I'm driving into the West Bank and they tell me, you know, isn't, isn't that dangerous? Like... Are you are you going to be safe? And and they text me in the morning before I, I head out and ask me to uh, let them know that I'm okay when I come back. Or is it the fear that I sense from my um, Palestinian 
partners that I work with in Masafriata who on a daily basis have uh, police cars and military um, units um, invading their villages and uh, so much so that one um, the presence of one police uh, vehicle at uh, uh, 8 a.m. is still in the consciousness and um, uh, of of my Palestinian partners at 8 p.m. You know they're they're still talking about the fact that there was a there was a police car in the morning. Did you see it? Um, uh, and just sharing that with me and um, yeah, we're we're a, we're a, we're a place full of fear. Um, um, it's it's specifically in these villages that I work at. You know, it's 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 stopping kids from going to school, um, or it's keeping them from falling to sleep, fall, uh, going to bed at night, and keeping them up with uh, nightmares. And um, at the same time, uh, you know, I'm I just feel I'm I need to let it. I'm I'm falling into this place of fear. But I do want to say there's uh, um, there are amazing amazing people on the ground doing really beautiful solidarity work who are who are sharing stories and um, like Breaking the Silence and um, other organizations that are trying to combat this fear and, and trying to build their own narratives of resilience and uh, communal work. And, um, and that's, why, that's why I'm doing this work because of those connections that I get to be a part of on a daily basis, like no matter what the circumstances are. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we'll take a couple questions from here. Um, you talked a little bit about the recent election. Um, Rabbi Ephraim Palkovitz talked about it a little bit in our intro. Um, I want to just ask about the intersection of, of re religious practice and violent religious extremism or violent extremism, um, because part of what broke my heart the few times that I've been in Hebron is seeing that this movement is a religious movement. It calls itself a religious movement. And, you know, you, you say in your bio in the first line that you grew up in a, in a Orthodox, in an Orthodox community in New York. And, you know, we, this is, ours is a religious community as well. Um, Ikar. And I'm really, for me, it's always, it's always very hard to understand, um, when people who, have both Jewish history and Torah at the heart of their lives could engage with such reckless cruelty toward another people. It's so contrary to everything that I understand our tradition to be driving us toward. And yet it's, it's unquestionable that this is a movement that is, that is in many ways driven by a religious fervor. And so I, I and especially, I mean, it's the, it's the, um, it's the Datizioni, it's the, you know, the religious Zionist part, parties in Israel. It is, um, it, it, there's, a, there's a messianic movement that's at the heart of a lot of this. And I, I wonder if we can just reflect honestly um, for some moments. I mean, it's not entirely true that the left is made up of, of Chilonim and, and the, you know, of secular people and the settlement enterprise is made up of entirely religious people. It's not so black and white. But there's a massive drive in the religious community um, toward what I consider extremism and, and violent religious violent religious extremism. And I just wonder if you would wouldn't mind addressing it, since uh, you spoke to it a little bit, and and I know it's part of your your identity as well. Yeah, um, I can add that. Um, yeah, definitely for me, this was. I grew up. You know, I grew up modern Orthodox, but like when I when I came to Israel, I definitely came in the religious Zionist spheres. Um, and as I was going through this uh, process of understanding what the occupation was and understanding that it was against my Jewish values, um, I started realizing like, you know, this is not uh, this is not the behavior. I mean, we're reading in this week's parsha, and even um, in Hebron itself, this is Parshat Chayei Sarah. This is the this is um, uh, the parasha that the settlers of uh, Hebron, it's their biggest Shabbat of the year. They invite tens of thousands of uh, visitors and supporters to come to Hebron. And everything you saw in the film is um, at its height in Hebron on this Shabbat. More areas are shut down. Uh, uh, settlers are expanding into areas uh, where Palestinians live that usually they don't even reach. And, and then Palestinians are being... Uh, put under curfew and not allowed to leave their homes. And there's 
uh, many times more soldiers than there typically are. Um, and to me, this is like uh, a, the, a, an extreme perversion, uh, violent and, um, you know, uh, repression and, and oppression of, 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 of our neighbors uh, in the land of, uh, in the Holy Land uh, of Israel. Um, is the opposite of the message that I read in 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 the stories in the Bereshit with Avraham. Uh, he is so uh, deferential. He's so always trying to make peace. He's always, you know, with the the shepherds of Lot who are doing uh, who are who are not respecting the property rights uh, of the local uh, residents. He goes the separate way. Which if you go left, I go right. That's how far he wants to be away with with this type of behavior. Which to me, when I see. S- you know, settlers breaking into Palestinian shops and harassing, you know, Palestinians uh, and calling for the forcible uh, um, uh, dispossession and eviction of, of Palestinian, their Palestinian neighbors. This is, um, this is the exact behavior that Avraham is trying to get so far away from. Um, and uh, to me, um, you know, the, it's called, uh, you know, uh, religious Zionist, the religious Zionist party, but I don't see anything that's religious or anything that's really truly a, a reflection of uh, uh, Jewish values in it. I think that um, it's probably not, um, I think a lot of people like me, like, uh, you know, we struggle and I don't, I don't blame anyone who grows up religious and confronts this reality and, and wants to be, you know, be far away from religion. But I think that there's a, a, a slow um, reclamation by a lot of religious people who uh, encounter this, um, there's a couple of initiatives. There's, um, you know, partner uh, one of the one of the found another one of the founders of uh, Breaking the Sounds. His name is Michael Menkin. Um, just re- wrote a book who's being translated into Hebrew about like really talking about. Um, Judaism, Jewish morality in an age of Jewish power, which is going to be coming out in English soon. And he talks a lot about his, his testimonies and breaking the silence. Um, w- right now in Israel, one of the most interesting things that's going on um, uh, uh, in the um, activist journalist space is one of the most popular and outspoken Israeli journalists speaking out in, in absolutely clear moral terms against the occupation. His name is Yisrael Fry. He's from Bnei Brak. He's Haredi. He's uh, um, He's like a Hasid, a Hasidic Jew from the Gore uh, sect. Um, and so I think it's not maybe discernible from the outside, especially given the election results. But I think there is uh, a growing movement. I mean, we're partnering more than we ever have with other NIF grantees like Rabbis for Human Rights and speaking out uh, against. Uh, we're speaking to more rabbinic students than we ever have. Um, Speaking about this uh, injustice and this uh, oppression um, in religious terms, and not just you know, of course, speaking about human rights and about you know power dynamics and you know that stuff uh, is important. But I think that we need to uh, incorporate religious messaging now more than ever um, in our fight to change the reality. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna open it up. I wonder if uh, we can take a couple of questions. Um, yes. And, and this is Jeff, but I don't know all of you, so if you don't mind just introducing yourself as you stand up to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for sharing these traumatic, pretty traumatic. But trying to get a sense of dealing with all that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you, Jeff. And I'm just going to repeat it because I don't know if folks who are watching on the recording could see, uh, could 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 hear what we were saying. But um, but the question is, um, does speaking this way publicly? Um, potentially fuel anti-Zionism and even anti-Semitism when when we give other people out in the broader population access to some of the worst behaviors that that are going on that are being perpetrated by um, Israeli soldiers. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer um, very briefly. And although, like, I didn't, I, I don't live in the U.S. right now, and you know, we, I don't live as a minority in the diaspora. Um, I did grow up in New York, and I know. Uh, from friends and relatives about ascendant anti-Semitism, and it's extremely, extremely disturbing. And I, uh, you know, I think that you know it's a really important challenge that we need to focus on and not uh, downplay by any in any way. Uh, I'll say that um, I think that um, you know, unfortunately, um, this isn't a conversation that we can have only in Israel, um, just because you know. Th- the reality is being affected by intervention, and I, and I, I think Rabbi—I uh, didn't get—I didn't read the whole article, but I think Rabbi Jill Jacobs just wrote a whole article about right-wing intervention in, into Israeli politics, which has enabled um, 
this situation to become what it is. Not just, you know, millions of dollars that is being raised by the Hebron Fund, which is a 503 uh, non-for-profit uh, non tax exempt uh, based in Brooklyn, but also advocacy. The Settler Council, the head of the Settler Council, his name Yassi Dagan, he comes to Washington to lobby. He meets with dozens of uh, members of Congress and he lobbies on behalf of this reality that we're talking about, that we saw in this film and what Maya and I described. Uh, he meets with people on both sides of the aisle. So the intervention is happening from particularly the U.S. community and particularly in the diaspora spaces. And so uh, we, we need to have these conversations here in order to counterbalance that and to have, um, you know, people whose values are aligned to not allow that to, to take place. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, um, given the fact that American policy uh, in particular, but in general, international communities' uh, reaction to what's going on here uh, has a huge effect on the ground. I think that if we um, don't take action because of fear um, of, of anti-Semitism, I think that uh, that's really giving the anti-Semites the, the greatest victory. Uh, if we're not able to have an, uh, an honest conversation, and I, again, we're not, we're not, you know, uh, you know, we're not engaging with anyone who's anti-Semitic or any, we don't even meet with groups that are, um, you know, uh, calling for a uh, uh, boycott. Sometimes we are ourselves, you know, uh, uh, boycott uh, targets. I mean, we're Israelis and we're not, um, we're not hiding that. Uh, we're talking about the occupation. We're not questioning the legitimacy of Israel. Uh, but if we're not able to have an honest conversation because of um, uh, the the actions and the and the and and the fear of anti-Semitism, I think it's a great victory because we were we will allow ourselves to um, um, to uh, to go into this downward spiral spiral and continue to go into this down downward spiral. And I think that. Um, I think that the anti-Semites are just going to hate Jews no matter what, what we do. Um, so we need to just focus on improving ourselves and not um, and, and fighting against anti-Semitism, but not doing it by self-censoring. That's, that's my uh, feeling. Um, I want I want I want to actually add something to that if I can, but, and then we'll go to another next question. Um, you know, when once you see the reality on the ground um, for people who are living under occupation, and you realize that it's illegal and that it's unethical and that it's unJewish and it's undemocratic, and that it's really causing immense pain to millions of people on a daily basis, and that it's jeopardizing the entire experiment of the state of Israel, so you wonder what needs to be done in order to end it, in order to change it, and and, and I, I mean I think that. Everyone in this room would agree that you know that that acts of violence, that terrorism, is not an acceptable way to um, you know to respond um, to occupation. I certainly feel that way, and and we've lost a couple friends in in various terrorist attacks, including at Hebrew University, and have lived there through some really hard times. Um, a second Intifada, and. Um, and my sister and brother both made Aliyah. I mean, I, I think, so, 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 so short of acts of physical violence, acts of violent resistance from Palestinians, acts of terror. Um, so what can they do? So then, you know, they go to the, Uni to the United Nations and they try, to, they try diplomacy. And the American Jewish community says, like, that's not acceptable. You can't go to the United Nations. This has to be a peace deal that's made between people. So that doesn't work. So then there's a boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which many people, by the way, including me, oppose because we feel like it's a cudgel instead of a scalpel. And we feel like, why should people like the two of you not be invited onto college campuses and, and suffer the, um, you know, and really suffer the consequences of an occupation that you resist yourself? So that's not acceptable either. So then how about just Jews, Israeli Jews, talking honestly in the world about what's going on and begging the world to care and to do something? So if that's not acceptable either, I just ask us to think about what is, like what, what could be done, what levers of power are left in order to change the situation on the ground if, it, if, it, if it's not violence and it's not diplomacy and it's not, it's not financial pressure and it's not even telling the truth anymore. So like what is left and what hope do we have that anything will ever change? Of all of those options, I certainly think that telling the truth is, is the best one on the table. And, and my hope is that 
through your really courageous actions and words that we're able to create a culture shift in which we see things differently. Um, I, I hope that there are ripples of change that come out of this every time, um, every time you speak and every page that you publish and every video that you make. Maya. Yeah. <clears throat> I just, I wanted to add something super small. Um, I think that nights like this where we're watching this film and people are learning about what's happening on the ground, although it is a real fear, anti-Semitism and the growth of anti-Semitism in the diaspora is, is legitimate. But we can all create the language and, and start to um, think about the nuances that exist between criticizing Israel and criticizing the policies of sending so, uh, young people to occupy another people um, on a daily basis and and what anti-Semitism really, really looks like on the ground. Um, because again, giving into that, not giving into it, but you know, focusing on, on the fear of the growth, it's, it's, it's actually more dangerous. Like Bensi said, it's giving uh, the real anti-Semites the, 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 the power. And I, I think Evenings like tonight, we can create the language and, and, um, and continue creating the language and the nuances that we want to um, spread out into the communities in the, in the states and in the di diaspora. Um, not that this responsibility should be on, the, on Jewish communities alone. It really shouldn't. We should have partners in this fight. But, but if we are here and we are invested, then, then why not take that, this time to start understanding how, how can we have these conversations and educate people around us? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, yes. Um, thank you very much for everything. Mm. What do you think about what I'm saying? I'm going to just very quickly reiterate the question. And let me just ask, because the hour is getting a little bit late, and we're gonna, we'll are gonna we be out of here in 10 minutes. Um, but I just want to ask for um, questions just to, we'll try and keep them as short as we can. But the, um, but this, uh, but the, the, the idea here is that the soldiers who are serving in these units um, are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder that engaging in this kind of service breaks the moral code of a soldier and ends up doing damage to Israeli society by damaging individual Israelis who have, uh, have seen and experienced uh, these, these kind of things. Your response? Yeah, we'll also try to keep our, 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 our answers uh, brief, but uh, we're not running out of here. So if anyone wants to stay extra and like discuss with us further, um, I'll just say very briefly, um, yeah, yeah, the, you know, um, there's PTSD and there's also moral injury. Um, and um, I think that um, uh, one of my colleagues who was actually a fellow testifier who also served with me in the same team in the same places, he wrote an interesting article uh, last spring. There was a, an incident that got a lot of attention because there's a big issue with neglect of mental health of IDF veterans. Um, and there was a soldier who uh, served in, in, the, in, the, in the war of 2014 and wasn't getting, um, wasn't getting proper treatment. Uh, he lit himself on fire outside of a benefits um, office and he was uh, in critical condition. He actually survived. Uh, but it led to a big protest movement. Um, and he wrote an article about, he thinks, he, explaining, and I, this is something I can attest to, um, there was no, there's no discussion with soldiers about reflecting. There's no discussion after these wars. There's no discussion. There's no public spaces. Soldiers who will have an honest and open conversation, and we're not, you know, we're obviously part of that, um, uh, are shut down. And there really isn't a public space for that to happen. And I think that it's the, 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 the suppression of people who, of soldiers who are coming out and making demands and saying, I want you to, I want the politicians to address this reality. And, um, and the, and the, that connection with the neglect of mental health, I think those two issues are tied. And my colleague wrote a, an article, uh, drawing that connection. I think it's, uh, true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. What do you see as Israel was the question? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. Um, how do you see Israel? How do you see the country? How do I see the country? Yeah. What do you see as a country? Um, I think that uh, Israel is um, both uh, both an idea um, and also a physical government and uh, a nation that has military force. Um, and I think that the idea. Um, to me, which I want Israel to be a democratic country and a country that uh, uh, 
is a realization of Jewish self-determination um, is uh, not being fulfilled um, because of the un undemocratic uh, act of controlling millions of people, kicking them off of their land, building settlements in that territory. Those, that, the territories that we're talking about that are, we're collecting testimonies from, from the Gaza Strip and from uh, the West Bank, this is not Israel. Israeli law doesn't apply there. It's military rule. And so... What are the borders of Israel? How do you see Israel as a country? What is the viability of Israel as a country within its borders? Describe your borders. Describe how do you... At, at, at Breaking the Silence, we partner with a, a wide spectrum of organizations that have different visions. Obviously, the mainstream vision, which is endorsed by hundreds of the top-ranking generals uh, in, in Israel is the two-state solution. You know, there are many organizations. We're not a security expert organization. There are other organizations that we partner with that have different visions, binational state, uh, a confederation program. But whatever vision you uh, endorse, um, what we say, and we, again, we're reflecting the testimonies of over f almost 1,400 IDF veterans, it cannot include plans to control millions of Palestinians against their will, no matter what. Now, we're not giving you all the answers. We're not dictating to people and partners what vision to endorse, but there are visions. There are very, very brilliant people who have devised maps and addressed every single issue, talking about the Geneva Initiative, talking about Commanders for Israel Security. I'm going to okay. I'm going to okay. just I want to make sure that we can get to there are a couple more questions yeah. so um you can finish your sentence but I want to I want to make sure Yeah, I'll just say folks. I'm representing breaking the silence. Maya and I are re representing breaking breaking the silence right now and we all have our personal opinions and we're not going to speak. We're going to be representing the broad spectrum here. Um happy to grab a beer maybe sometime and we can talk about that but as a breaking the silence representative I'm not going to endorse a specific vision. Okay, I'm gonna take a last couple of questions. Um, can, yes. The, okay, the question was, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Okay, so were, are there repercussions for people who give testimony and what happens to soldiers who refuse orders to do things like what we've seen in the video? Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to say very briefly that uh, soldiers who rev refuse orders can be pl placed in jail. We don't have testimonies from soldiers who, who refused orders. Um, but that is, uh, we, you know, there are testifiers that refuse to do uh, reserve duty who have gone to jail. Um, there are, you know, we have testifiers who do reserve duty every couple of months. And every time they go into the West Bank, they give us testimony. So again, we have a wide spectrum, but you can't refuse orders. It's not really something that you can do unless it, there's something in Hebrew called a, a black flag uh, is flying over the order. Um, but, n but we don't have testimony from any soldiers who, uh, you know, uh, felt or, or, or refused for that reason. Um, I'll let Maya maybe address like the, the back, the... The, the second part of the question about the price that testifiers uh, pay. Okay, so I'll, I'll yeah, I mean, uh, everyone is, you know, within their, whichever community uh, you're coming from, uh, um, you know, we have had soldiers that have been targeted by, you know, far right, you know, comrades in arms, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that, um, you know, my friends in the, in, in uh, you know, my unit, like, you know, even if they don't disagree with me, we are able to have a uh, respectful uh, and loving relationship. Um, but I know people who's, it's very difficult with their family. You know, everyone, it's really an individual thing. I will say uh, on the national level with increasingly right-wing governments, we've been targeted over and over again by the highest levels mm -hmm. of Israeli government. And there's been some really, um, really uh, horrific things that have been said against us, calling us traitors and things like that. And that's uh, really, really difficult. I think what we'll do, because we have five minutes left, is I'm going to take a couple of questions and then we'll try to address as many as we can in these last few minutes. So, Andrea, I think I saw your hand. So, um, I want to go back to a moment in the film where um, a number of people retorted that Israel was the Okay, so the first question is about going into homes uh, in the middle of the night when soldiers often don't know what they're looking for. And there's both a moral dimension to that and a security dimension to that. If it's okay, I'm just going to take two more questions and then we'll try to remember them and we're going to get through them quickly. Uh, yes, you're right here. And then we'll come to you. 
I've been a supporter of uh, the New Israel Fund and all the things that you've been talking. Would that make a change in Israel if there was a boycott? Okay, is it time to be to rethink the opposition to uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions given the new Israeli government and the growing trend over the last 20 years toward um, more right-wing ultranationalist extremism? Um, okay, the last question. I'm sorry, I know that there's still a couple more, and I hope f folks will stick around for a few minutes afterwards, but we got to wrap soon, so... Mm -hmm. But that is a, an excellent uh, question. So thank you. And you didn't even not even mention um, that APAC supported 109 insurrectionist supporting candidates in the in this uh, most recent midterm election here in the United States. So the, I mean, all of this is intertwined, and that's a very it's a it's a very important point that you brought up. Okay, so um, people entering homes in the middle of the night. There's a moral question. There's a security question. They don't even know what they're there for. Um, advocates of BDS. Um, should the progressive Zionist camp, which largely opposes BDS, be rethinking uh, that opposition? And how dangerous are alternative facts to the to the health and well-being of American democracy, of Israeli democracy, and of the and of Jews worldwide? Okay, um, I'll start by answering your question as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, so, you know. Uh, we believe that we're sending soldiers into the West Bank to um, secure our civilians, X, Y, Z. Um, but the truth is, is that um, we, we can send about 25,000 soldiers. At any given moment, there's about 25,000 soldiers in the West Bank serving. Um, and that means that we can't be at, there, there are 2 million, uh, 2.7 million Palestinians living in the West Bank. And if we really believe that every everyone is super hostile, we have to make sure that they, they feel a sense of, of dread and, and, and fear and make sure that they keep our heads down. There's a saying, um, and not uh, resist. And so basically um, missions like that where you go inside a home and you take over um, and you tell kids stay in this room and we're going to check, it has to do with making sure that we're instilling fear inside the Palestinian communities. Um, and um, I, I'm debating if I should say this because we're trying to wrap up, but um, I work in these villages where um, uh, uh, 12, uh, 8 to 12 Palestinian villages have been declared a firing zone, which means we can do, we conduct training on these villages. Um, and, you know, there's a testimony of a soldier who, um, he's serving uh, close to these areas, um, close to these villages, and his, uh, he was doing a training week, and his officer lost a night division goggles. And so what does that mean for them? They, they, one of the officers said, I think, you know, I think one of these villages right next door, they, someone there stole the night vision goggles. And what does that mean? The entire uh, platoon, the unit, uh, decided to go and um, look for these goggles, but they actually turned this this mission for searching into these searching for the goggles as a um, training, as if they're uh, conquering a village, as if they're in war and they're about to conquer a village, uh, a Lebanese a Lebanese village, and so they turned this innocent village into a war zone. Um, and and in his testimony, he says that no one no one spoke up, no one resisted, and and all of the soldiers were like really, really confused about this uh, mission because they didn't understand what, what, what are we doing? Are we training? Is this operational? They didn't understand and, and they left feeling very, very unsettled. Um, and um, it's, it's, it, it's, we're doing a really great job in making sure people will keep their heads down and, and many, many missions have um, that intent. Yeah, I'll... Uh I'll try to uh, answer the other uh, two questions. Um, so with regards to um, the results of the election and the general direction of the country, I think that, yes, it is definitely like a, a cause for despair. Um, and, I, and I definitely think, you know, we do have to, uh, you know, re-engage. I think that within... Uh, and I do think, and I'll, I'll just connect it to the other, the other question, we need external pressure. We need this, the, this is only able to happen um, because of intervention. 
we need we're having we're intervention both uh lobbying diplomatic and military and economic uh support for policies that are aligned with mayor kahana and uh itamar ben gvir and jewish supremacy and racism and we need to we need to stop that we need to pull that out now at breaking the science we talk about um we talk about the occupation and we're talking about a military occupation that we're imposing on uh, millions of Palestinians against their will. Now, that's something that um, we get criticized for from uh, uh, the settler movement, um, who say, How, why are you differentiating between uh, Tel Aviv and Kiryat Arba? And our message is there is a fundamental difference between areas where Israel is imposing military rule over undemocratically over millions of people who have no representation in Israel uh, versus um, what's going on in Israel proper, where, of course, there are problems, of course, there's structural, you know, uh, discrimination, but it's fundamentally different. And, and um, both the settler movement, and they do this in a violent way, they violently and forcefully are imposing their vision uh, in the occupied territories, and the boycott movement is not differenti differentiating between the occupation uh, and Israel itself. Now, that's not to say that boycott is, uh, is uh, inherently anti-Semitic or inherently... Um, uh, you know, I illegitimate. Certainly, you know, what options do Palestinians have? Of, you know, uh, I would much prefer that over uh, violent, violent resistance against uh, Israel. But uh, it's, I don't think, I think that there's still so much we can do um, and, and that is in a targeted way against the occupation, specifically and not broadly against Israel. There's so many, we're, you know, there's so much untested ground of leveraging the diaspora positioning uh, with elected officials that I think we haven't even, we haven't even tried yet. So we really need to turn up the, turn up the flame on those efforts and uh, we need to double down now, especially at this moment of clarity when we see what the Israeli policies that have been carried out are now the public face of this uh, uh, imminently forming government. Thank you so much. So I, what I want to say is that if you have felt over the course of the last couple of weeks since these Israeli elections, um, a sense of despair or a sense that, I mean, it, maybe we reached the, uh, we're in the 11th hour or maybe past it. Um, there is one thing that you can do, and that is to support the work of the New Israel Fund, which is um, supporting Breaking the Silence and many other organizations working to preserve and protect and sustain and amplify um, democracy and civil society organizations. Um, and I, I'm so, I, I'm really grateful, um, Ephraim, to you uh, for bringing this program here. Our friend, uh, Daniel Sokach, who is one of the founders of ICAR, um, is the CEO of, of um, the New Israel Fund, and along with Mickey Gitson, an incredible team, both in the United States um, and in Israel and throughout the diaspora, um, really working on the front lines to make sure that it's not yet too late. And I know that many of us have been worrying that we're getting closer and closer to the point where it's going to be too late, but it's not yet too late. I want to say that um, a couple of years ago, David, with some tapes were found uh, that David Ben-Gurion had uh, recorded at some point. And he says in these tapes that Israel's moral compass is inexorably tied to its treatment of the non-Jews living under its rule. This is a moral call. This is not something that's new. This is a moral call that for decades and decades has been sounded. It is our job, I believe, as American Jews to amplify these voices. I really bless you both with health and with strength and with continued moral clarity. And we will be here to support you and to amplify you and to partner with you so that we can bring about the just and shared society that we share as a dream. Thank you all so much. And I want to give a, a special thank you, um, not only to Ephraim, but to Susan and Ben, to Matt and Michael um, from the ECAR team. We're really grateful to um, our staff for helping make this night possible. Thank you all so much for being here. Please grab a snack um, on your way out. Thank you.